G'day viewers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to the channel where I'm bringing you an interesting article from the Financial Times about negative prices. We saw earlier this week, oil went below zero all the way down to $40 per barrel. As companies had too much oil to store, they were paying the consumer to take it off their hands. In fact, I even watched a news piece about cargo ships or oil liners that would normally move oil from one port to another, in fact being used only to store oil. Massive ships that of course hold huge quantities of oil are typically used just to move oil from one port to another. Well there is so much oil out there that is not being used at the moment that these ships are being used to store this commodity. But it goes into other prices, thinking in the broader community, the broader economic concept of what is a good, what is a service, what is a supply and what is a demand. Well we can see such a huge supply of certain commodities or stocks out there that the demand is now so low that people will pay you to take it away. We've seen this before, not even during COVID-19 crisis times, for example rubbish. If you've got too much waste, the supply is so big, the demand is so low that it in fact goes into a negative price where you will pay someone to take that rubbish away. We can also see a blurred line where some man's rubbish or one man's trash is another man's treasure and an example of that in the waste area might be aluminium cans. So you might buy a can, have a drink of soft drink, throw it away and that is trash to you. But to another company that is a recyclable good that could be worth something. So there are instances where people will pay you to take away their rubbish but it could be to your advantage if you could use that rubbish to your good. I also remember when I was in Korea they separated the rubbish so much that you would have food waste, even at the home you'd separate your food waste and we used to put them in these little red bins. Someone would come and collect these tiny little red bins, throw it into their uh, larger storage containers and they would turn that into either pig food or um, fertilizer and it was a waste that became another person's treasure. That is one man's waste or one man's trash is another man's treasure when it comes to those types of wasteful commodities or products. But when we go to oil we can see that some countries have in fact been using this low price in the oil commodity crisis that they've been stockpiling oil. That is they know that they're going to need oil in the future and crude oil has a very good shelf life and if you can buy it up now at a very cheap price, even free, even if you have to pay for that storage, you can use it at a later time. But of course, you will always have to store that stock somewhere. I say the uh, same thing with gold. If you're going to buy lots of gold, even if it's given to you, you have to keep it somewhere. You might get rid of that gold straight away, as provided there is a market to take that gold and sell it and give you money or something, something else for it, that's fine. But if you've got something that you have to store, it costs money to store things. Whether it's oil or gold or physical vaults of cash, it costs money to store and secure these things. But as we go into this article written by Robert, Robin Harding, I want you to think about the, the value of a commodity and how supply and demand, those curves can sometimes, sometimes almost invert where people will pay you to take away something. The article reads, there are not many things you have to pay to get rid of. Hair, rodents, industrial waste, teenage children, and as of this week, crude oil. On Monday, the price of West Texas Intermediate for delivery in the month of May fell as low as minus $40.32 a barrel, becoming negative for the first time in history. People have schemed, starved, and even gone to war to get oil. But this week, even if only briefly, they would have paid you to take it off their hands. Crude oil's dramatic price fall shows the depth of the current plunge in demand and sheds light on the curious phenomenon, phenomenon of negative prices. These are actually fairly common, occurring everywhere from electricity markets to stock exchanges that pay for order flow to boost liquidity, but they are unsettling because they seem to upset the natural order of things. Surely an item of such obvious cost and utility as oil must always be worth something? Humans being up Human beings are prone to the cognitive bias of loss aversion, putting more weight on a loss than an equivalent gain. It is not surprising, therefore, that we feel a certain horror of negative prices at negative prices. They suggest your assets can turn to liabilities, losing you everything and more. An example of that, as I digress from this article, is houses. When we saw the big global financial crisis in 2008, some houses became this liability. If we look at the city of Detroit, you own a house, the car market went bust, all these people led, left the area, leaving streets and streets, suburbs completely empty with the houses still there and they couldn't sell the houses. 
So you think, well, how could that cost you more to own? Well, of course, you had to maintain that house or you had to, at a minimum, insure that house. And if you've got no one renting that house and you can't sell that house and you're paying money to insure it and maintain it, then you now have a liability that is putting you in a difficult situation. And if you're pushed to the edge of financial security and you're in a situation where you're paying thousands of dollars in insurance or land, even if you don't insure it, you've got to pay land tax and you have to pay rates. So even if you say, I'm going to let this house fall to pieces, I'm not going to do anything with it. Well, it's still a liability because you've got to pay those taxes. So if someone said to you, hey, there's no way you can get rid of this house, you either pay the government $2,000 a year in tax and land rates and so forth, or if you give me a hundred bucks, I'll take it off your hands. You can really see that you're now giving up a $200,000 house. You're paying someone to take it away. Now that example might seem extreme today, but in fact that was what was happening back in 2008 where some properties were so expensive to maintain at a minimum because of taxes that people were either giving them away or letting the banks take them away with no returns to the person who originally owned it. And the same applies for oil. But as we go into this article, we can now see how it applies to money. Back to the article, it reads, that, dis that distaste shows itself, more, shows itself most strongly in the widespread anger across Europe and Japan at negative interest rates, the world's most prominent negative price and likely to continue for years to come. The obvious question posed by negative prices is why trade occurs at all if the price is less than zero? Why not hold on to what you have? There are at least three different reasons. The first is a storage problem. So I'll just fix this up. The first is a storage problem, familiar to anybody clearing a house for sale. The grand piano may be beautiful, but if there's going to be nowhere to put it, it turns from an asset into a liability as the day of the move draws near. US oil traders found themselves in a similar position this week. Owning a barrel of WTI at contract expiry means taking physical delivery in Cushing, Oklahoma. You cannot keep crude oil in the attic. So, if oil storage tanks are full, you have a serious problem. A similar thing happens in electricity markets. Electricity is notoriously hard to store, but shutting down a coal or nuclear plant is costly and time consuming. So when supply exceeds demand, it, make, it can make sense to pay users to take it. This situation is occurring more often as solar and wind which have minimal operating costs and generate power as long as the sun shines and the wind blows, join electricity grids. It can also occur if there are subsidised suppliers who make money at negative price if the subsidy is more. Now I'll just pause on that point for a moment. This is where the blockchain is, is good. There is a cryptocurrency called Power or Power Ledger, code P-O-W-R, and this talks about this um, cryptocurrency is a solution, or this blockchain rather, or it's cryptocurrency as well, but the Programming behind it enables the distribution of renewable energy. So the old model of renewable energy or energy at all is we produce energy, we give it to a centralized body, and then that centralized body sells it to the market. And it can be very inefficient in the sense that the centralized body is a bit of a monopoly or at least a duopoly or an ogolopoly where you have centralized bodies controlling the prices of all of this energy that's coming through, irrespective of how it's produced. Now that we have the power of the blockchain and a coin such as PowerLedger, you could actually distribute this electricity to anyone, anywhere in the market at any time for almost free, making a very good profit for those who produce it. So if you've got solar panels on your roof, you can produce this electricity uh, from simply doing nothing, That's, that is sitting there and letting the sun power your solar panels. And then the market, the free market, can go and buy that electricity at a cheaper rate. You get a clean profit from uh, producing that electricity and selling it to the market. And the consumer gets a good price because they're not going through a third party or a centralized body who's taking a cut from that. And that is an example of how uh, cryptocurrencies and the power of the blockchain or Internet 2.0, as some people call it, will provide a very good experience as we move forward. And I even applied this model in a thought experiment today of getting a cryptocurrency for petrol. That is, we invest in a cryptocurrency that is related to energy, whether it be solar energy or fuel energy, and we distribute it throughout the the grid or the system using a cryptocurrency. It would have many limitations, but mark my words, someone will create a, a petrol crypto and that petrol crypto would be a, or an oil crypto and it will be around the distribution and pricing, perhaps even hedging of energy. We can already see it in electricity and wind and renewable energies. It'll only be a matter of time before someone tries it in oil and fossil fuels. 
But that's for a different story as we read on here on the second reason for negative prices is when there is a liability attached to an asset. Contaminated land may cost less than nothing because of the expense of cleaning it up, but when BMW sold the British car company Rover in, 2000, in the year 2000, it provided a dowry of hundreds of millions of pounds to reflect the dire state of the business. Likewise, unless waste can be recycled at a profit, it has a negative price because of the disposal cost. The th a third scenario is when something appears to have a negative price but the buyer is actually providing the seller with something of value. For example, a bike sharing network may pay its customers if they ride its bikes from suburbs back to the centre of the city where they, be, where they may be needed more. Stock exchanges may pay retail brokers for the privilege of executing their orders because such orders are of value to the customers such as market makers who can profit by trading with it. Uh, there's a good example, I'll just digress slightly there, with the, the bike network. So we saw these bike networks in China. Uh, what The problem with those bike ne networks were, in the simulated model, people would ride their bike, a, a centralised, sorry, a decentralised bike, that means everyone could use it. So you could just go up to a bike rack, uh, scan your uh, phone, and say, right, I'm taking this bike for the next hour, you'd ride it from point A to point B. And the theory was that person who rode it from point A to point B would eventually ride it from point B back to point A. But the issue was, of course, is that many people were just going from point A to point B, and when you went to point B in the end, there were these huge piles of bikes, thousands and thousands of bikes piled upon one another, because no one was riding them back to point A. So in this example, they say, well, that is a situation where you would actually pay someone to ride that bike back to point A. Another example is going back to the, uh, the article here is that interest rates can also go negative because of the storage problem. Buying a safe costs money. There is still a risk of theft and furthermore large payments with cash are cumbersome so paying for storage in a bank deposit can make sense. The economist Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard has suggested the abolition of high denomination notes, removing them as a storage option, which would allow for deeper negative rates as a tool to stimulate activity in the economy. This idea has not proved popular. So I just want to touch on that point because this is where I'm really big. When I, if you're not new to my channel, you know I often compare gold and Bitcoin. And some people are really big on gold and some people are really big on crypto. And I'm more uh, inclined to support Bitcoin uh, as opposed to gold, simply for the storage problem and the fungibility problem. If you gave me $100 million worth of Bitcoin, I could store it, in theory, with a seed code in my head. That is, I wouldn't, in theory, I actually don't physically need anything. If my brain was good enough to remember these series of words or the actual private key, I don't actually need physically anything to store that whatsoever anywhere. Now, if my brain isn't that good and I can't remember those seed words, I could actually just write it down. I could write it down on a piece of paper. I could take a photo of it. I could store it on a thumb drive. I could store it on a hard wallet. But even if you put that 100 million to a billion to a trillion, if the market cap ever got that big, and I stored all of this money that you gave me in crypto, it doesn't matter how much you give me. All I need to remember is a series of words or letters or characters, and I can store infinite, infinite amounts of that commodity, that stock, that value, that Bitcoin. That is not true for gold. If you gave me a hundred million or a billion dollars worth of gold, I need a big space. And then I need a lot of security. And then I probably need an insurance fund as well. And comparative, and then if I wanted to move it, I need a lot of money to move it. So it is expensive to store anything, but it's expensive to store really expensive things because you need a higher level of security and you need a higher level of insurance. Whereas that when it comes to uh, storing digital code, well, sure, you want to have some type of security around it. That is, if I wrote down my private key, I, I don't want to just leave that private key lying on my lounge room floor. I'd want to put it in a safe. But again, the safe could be a big a safe, a small safe, or a medium-sized safe, and the, it wouldn't matter how much Bitcoin I've got. One dollar or a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, the storage space is the same. It is not the case for gold, and it is not the case for cash. And that's why cash is an issue as well, because if you've got lots of cash, you need to store it somewhere, which is why they're going to get rid of cash, as in governments when I say they, um, not just because of other reasons about controlling how you spend your money, but also because it is a way of locking, a, it is a way of saving money because they don't need all these vaults to save it. And not only they don't need vaults to save it and store it, that they also don't need the huge printing presses anymore because printing cash costs a lot of money. And you also don't need the disposal of cash. And what I mean by that is, cash, physical cash, gets to the end of its life cycle and you've got to destroy it. 
And it's not just a case of throwing it into a fire and burning it, which they do. They put it in an incinerator and they burn it at a very high temperature. But you also have to account for that. There has to be some type of financial accounting process where they say, right, we've just destroyed, I don't know, I'll make up a number, $100 million worth of $10 notes. So now we need another $100 million worth of $10 notes. There is an administrative process behind that. But when you're doing it digitally, first of all, you never have to destroy that digital currency. And secondly, to produce it, there's not a printing press or a truck that does it. So digital is already here. It's just that as we transition from digital fiat to digital crypto, we're going to see a transition of banks slowly dying. Now, if you do want to buy Bitcoin, by the way, or cryptocurrencies, check out my links below. These are secure links that will ensure that you don't go to shadow sites and you can safely buy Bitcoin or Ethereum or Ripple or any cryptocurrency you like. Links are below. Check them out. No cost to join any of these sites. Very secure. They help me help you. And if you don't know how to buy crypto, look at some of my how-to videos links also below. But I read on. The mechanics of negative prices are straightforward enough. But what they cannot explain is why a barrel of oil or a cash deposit would become of so little value that the cost of storage is relevant. In the case of oil this week, the answer is clear. Demand has collapsed because of the coronavirus pandemic. So storage, either by leaving oil in the ground or pumping it into a super tanker, is the only option. Something similar has happened to interest rates, which balance the supply of saving with the demand for investment. In an aging, slow-growth world, the supply of risk-free deposits is high, but the demand to borrow them is not, so the price is often negative. That feels wrong and prompts a great deal of anger at, anger at central banks as the world struggles with the coronavirus downturn. It is not only oil traders who will feel the pain of negative prices. So a really interesting article, and before I close off with the joke of the day, this is where we have to really think about what is money. You can see now as we go into negative interest rates, part of the negative interest rates is to actually force you to spend your money. So you put money into a bank, you realize that, hey, it costs, it costs you to store money in the bank. That is, you put $100 in the bank and it's going to cost you a, a dollar a year to store that. You think, well, I better get rid of that because if I don't get rid of it, at the end of the year, I'll only have $99. Then you throw inflation on top of that, and let's say inflation is $2, and you say, well, if I put $100 in the bank, I'm going to lose a dollar in interest and $2 in inflation. Now I've only got $97. So that actually, in theory, in pure economic theory, that forces you to take the money out of the bank and spend it. And you spend it because if you don't spend it, it's going to erode to nothing. And then when you spend it, in theory, it stimulates the economy. And now the economy is moving again because people are buying stuff. You're buying coffee, you're going shopping, you're making investments, and you're making the economy move. So you're going to be in a situation where negative interest rates and inflation are going to ensure that you spend your money. Now, that might seem great in the short and medium term, but how are you going to save for your retirement? And what if you don't want to spend money? What if you don't want to buy crap that destroys the environment or pollutes the world? What if you have everything you need and you, you want to buy your food, water and shelter, but there isn't really much more you need? Well, in this current situation, banks don't want to store your cash because it costs too much to do so. Governments don't want to bring inflation to zero because inflation is the invisible tax where they can get more money out of you by simply printing money and eroding your savings. And there's not many opportunities to invest because the economy is in a downturn. So you're in this really difficult situation. And you can see from this article that, in fact, we are moving to negative prices in a more common situation in, in more fields than you'd realize, not just oil, not just rubbish, but now physical cash. Cash is going to be worth less, literally worthless to the point that people one way or another would pay you to take it away. And what do I mean by that? Well, that's where you could get a loan and the cost of the loan, in fact, could be almost to a point where they're paying you. It's a theory that is difficult to grasp. It feels unnatural. It doesn't feel comfortable. But as we have seen in this article and over the last week, who would have ever thought that someone would be paying you to take away the world's most demanded commodity, oil? Mind-boggling stuff. Let's close off with a joke for the day. Here's a joke relative to supply and demand in the human labor market. Reaching the end of a job interview, the human resources officer asks a young engineer fresh out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and what starting salary are you looking for? The engineer replies, in the region of $125,000 a year, depending on the benefits package. The interviewer inquires, well, what would you say to a package of five weeks vacation, 14 paid holidays, full medical and dental, 
company matching retirement fund to 50% of salary and a company car leased every two years, say a red Corvette. The engineer sits up straight and says, wow, are you kidding? The interviewer replies, yeah, but you started it. I'm Adam Stokes. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're getting anything out of this. Um, don't forget also, if you are interested in buying cryptocurrency, check out my links below, secure links so you can get into the crypto market, something that I started my journey on YouTube talking about as I expand more into the economic space. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. Be safe. Get into those negative buys if you can. And I'll talk to you next time.